it's a tremendous economic sophism to believe that you can print your way into prosperity when all the evidence is against it. I mean, if printing of money and debt grows would lead to prosperity, then Zimbabwe would be by far the richest country. The country, by the way, run by Robert Mugabe, the economic mentor of Ben Bernanke. <laughs> now, the other... The, the other point I mentioned to you earlier when I talked about debt to GDP are the unfunded liabilities. Over the last 10 years, actually, the big deficit were the unfunded liabilities that went up. And so the government debt with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and General Motors and so forth and the unfunded liabilities is more like 600% of GDP. There you add the 250% of GDP private credit uh, then you get something like 800% debt to GDP. I tell you, sovereign credits in the Western world, they're all bankrupt. But before they officially go bankrupt and can't pay, they're going to print money and massively so. That should be very clear because that's the easiest way politically to postpone the hour of truth. You postpone the problem to the next president or to the next party or whatever it is, and that, I think, should be very clear. Some people say, oh, they can't print money. As I said, you can send a check to people. You can essentially, when people say deficits don't matter, I actually wonder why do people actually have taxes? They shouldn't pay any tax at all. You just finance everything through deficits. It's much simpler. Much, makes much, everybody much happier. So, I mean, sometimes I have to say, when I look at the e economists in academia, I'm sure they're very, all very intelligent and that I, they study the textbooks except the wrong ones, and B, they're totally inconsistent in their views. Now, the one thing I want to reiterate about an environment where you print money is this. In the late 70s, we had a boom in Latin America, which came about as a result of rapid credit growth. Credit came to Latin America via the OPEX surpluses that were channeled through American banks into Latin America. And then, after 1980, when the oil price no longer went up, Latin America had a credit crisis, the so-called petrodollar crisis. And the Latin American governments reacted like the U.S. government in the last two years. They created large fiscal deficits and they printed money. So what then happened is this. The currency, and I, here I take the example of Mexico. The currency of Mexico collapsed between 79 and 87 by 95 percent. So if you were unlucky and you bought Mexican pesos here, or you were a Mexican and you held Mexican pesos here, then obviously you lost 95% of your value compared to, at the time, the US dollar was a strong currency. Now, what was the best way to actually survive this period of rapid uh, currency depreciation? Now, here you have three tables. This is the Mexican stock market in local currency. In other words, in peso terms. This is the Mexican stock market in dollar terms, and this is the performance of the Mexican fund, which is run by a fund manager. Now, in local currency, to make things simple, the Mexican market went as the currency tumbled here. There's an adjustment in stock prices on the upside. If I print money, Everything in this room will go up. Some things will go up more than others. But the currency goes down. So as the currency went down, stocks in nominal terms or local terms went up. The index from 1,000 here in 79 to a peak of 343,000 in 87. Then we had the crash in 87, global crash. Then we ended up here at 139,000. So from start 1979, to the end here in 1988, we were up 139 times in local currency terms. 
But of course, in dollar terms, the situation looked different because, as I mentioned, the currency collapsed here completely. So what then happened in dollar terms is this. Depending whether you were lucky or unlucky in the first year of 79 to buy Mexican stocks, you bought them at the high of 70 or at the low of 48 or 45 here. And then they went up to 220 in 87 and then closed at 62 here. So essentially in stocks, your purchasing power was more or less maintained. You didn't lose, you didn't really make any money, but you didn't lose any money. Cash holders, of course, they got slaughtered, and bondholders in local currencies also, because the interest rates never really adjusted sufficiently on the upside. So in an environment of money printing, as I mentioned before, cash and bonds are not very desirable. Stocks are not perfect, but still they kind of keep the purchasing power alive.